Committee will come to order. Thank you for uh, your patience while uh, we conducted a series of votes on the floor of the House of Representatives. Uh, we're going to pick up where we left off and hear testimony from Mr. Warren. Uh, you may proceed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. It's uh, on behalf of Baltimore Substance Abuse Systems, which is the uh, uh, funding strategic planning entity that uh, funds over 60 drug treatment programs in Baltimore City, treats 21,000 people. I appreciate sharing the story of what uh, we've been able to accomplish with medicated assisted treatment. Uh, which is one aspect of my talk. The second is to describe some of the experiences I had uh, as Director of Substance Abuse Treatment Services for the state prison system and how we can use medication assisted treatment to better link people into care upon release. Uh, I was struck very much by the quality of the debate uh, that happened prior to the, to, uh, the break and there's some several key philosophical approaches that uh, I use in my work that I, I've learned over the years of, of counseling people suffering from addiction. And that is, it is very, very important to take advantage of that, what I call motivational moment that an individual has that says, I have a problem and substance abuse may be the, uh, one of the root causes of it. That's the first piece. The second is that recovery takes a long time. That uh, phrase, it takes a village, is very, very true. What we've decided to do in Baltimore is begin to change the way we even describe treatment. We prefer a language that says continuity of care, that someone comes into an emergency room because they have liver pain. They then get into one type of substance abuse care transition to another type of substance abuse care, and then transition to another type of substance abuse care. The end result may be recovery coaches that aren't sponsors, aren't counselors, but really help that person better integrate into society. We think medication-assisted treatment is a significant lever to helping improve the outcomes of the patients that we see. So just to back up for a minute, let me describe briefly what is going on in Baltimore. Baltimore is a population just up the street, uh, 650,000 people, of which 12% suffer from substance abuse. Uh, we have the unfortunate luxury of having heroin uh, uh, dominate the admissions into treatment. So 67% of all admissions, heroin is cited as their primary drug of choice. That's given us the ability to develop unique interventions targeted to one drug one illicit drug rather than be concerned about uh, evidence-based practices across a wider range of drugs. In 2006, uh, we, uh, prior, I was with the state prison system at the time, but Dr. Josh Sharstein, who's currently the deputy director of the FDA, really thought of buprenorphine as a potential uh, to really make a difference in Baltimore City. So what was decided to do, have create, and during my tenure we've expanded a great deal, is to set up a public health response to an individual disease. So let me tell you what that means. It means that whether you go into an outpatient program, into an ER, or into a detention center, that you should have the option of medication. The benefit of buprenorphine for us which is different than methadone, which we're a big supporter of, uh, is that we fund the substance abuse treatment for that individual for the first 35 days. We stabilize that person in treatment on average of 155 days. At that point, the person has health entitlement benefits and their urines are free, drug free, and they've begun to really achieve some substantial milestones in terms of their recovery. They then are transitioned to a continuing care doctor. So because of the comprehensive system of helping people get insurance, stabilizing them in care, and then moving to continuing care doctors, we're freeing up our financing, and we're also freeing up space within our treatment programs. Uh, to illustrate this, uh, when I 
took over uh, at, at BSAS, uh, we had 112 buprenorphine slots, spaces. Uh, we currently have 506. Uh, through, the, through those slots, we have transitioned over 3,000 people to continuing care doctors who are getting their medications you know, and being treated for their other medical issues and mental health issues in federally qualified health centers and primary care physician offices. The best news of all is that 94% of those people, those stable people that we've transitioned to continuing care doctors, still are remaining care after six months. So they now have health insurance, they're stable, they're in active recovery, and they continue to be in what we call a medical home, that primary care physician that's going to help look after all of their needs. You know, and some of the stories, particularly from the panelists to my right, you know, there are a great number of medical complications that frequently are related to addiction. And uh, to be able to get someone placed in a place where all of those things can be taken care of comprehensively is just such a significant advantage. We believe that the way we're incentivizing care today uh, has to fundamentally change. We currently fund episodic acute care. What we're interested in doing is creating new funding mechanisms that reward the referral, in other words, the emergency room, the detention center, or the drug treatment program to refer somebody to another type of substance abuse care, and they should be financially incentivized as well. So instead of just funding one place with four walls and a roof, we want to fund the entire system and have the funding follow the patient. Uh, uh, that's our buprenorphine initiative in a nutshell. Let me switch very quickly to my work in corrections. Uh, prior to my starting at uh, public safety in 2005, people regularly died uh, in our detention center and prison of overdose. Uh, this, the single biggest period of overdose deaths uh, is after someone leaves an institution and they go back and try to use the same dose of heroin that they did prior to their incarceration, or when they leave hospital stays. Uh, this is a significant challenge uh, in filling, uh, in sorry, significant ca challenge in causing stress with correctional officers, institutions, and it's a public safety issue within detention centers and prisons, which is illicit drug use. So for us, what happened was uh, in our detention center, we process within Baltimore City about 85,000 people. We now assess every single one of those people. Se over 70% readily self-report that they have an addiction problem. We believe it's higher than that, but just that they would self-report it is that's a substantial um, benefit. We then uh, now induce people on methadone and detox them with methadone inside the detention center. And in the calendar year before I left, we detoxed uh, 5,400 people uh, using methadone and other drugs. People who get arrested on methadone were historically thrown off of their dose. We now maintain those individuals on methadone while they're incarcerated so that if they do get probation, if they uh, are released on their own recognizance or make bail, they can return to their program without having to go through withdrawal. This has saved lives in Baltimore City. What we now plan to do in our next phase, uh, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to come on board with uh, in charge of Baltimore City, is I need to in increase the infrastructure to absorb heroin addicts who come in because of a drug-related offense, we want to induce them, start them on buprenorphine or methadone, and have them leave the institution the same day get medicated upon release, which then takes the significant pressure of withdrawal and the need to commit new criminal acts away from them. Um, we think in doing this will make a substantial impact on the murder rate, crime, spread of HIV and other things. Uh, I, by I, the end of this fall. Could you, could you wrap up your testimony? Yeah, sure. Um, this fall we'll have uh, some research coming out that uh, will help us determine if we've saved money with health care expenses deferred, uh, recidivism rates, 
you know, and otherwise, because we think we potentially have a story to tell. We just need outside researchers to come in and help us tell our story rather than us trying to tell our own story. But uh, thank you for the opportunity to share. Thank you, Mr. Warren. Mr. Hall. Th uh, thank you, Chairman uh, Kucinich. Um, I am basically uh, Mr. Warren's um, equivalent in Fairfield County, Ohio, um, which is uh, a mixed rural suburban uh, community um, that is adjacent to uh, Columbus. Um, I, to be completely honest, thank you. To, to be completely honest, I'm rather amazed at how um, common all of the themes are uh, in, in terms of what people are, are uh, talking about here. Um, what, what I would like to discuss uh, briefly is um, the scope of uh, what I believe may be the most profound um, public health problem that has ever confronted our state and what I think are some potential solutions to uh, that problem. First of all, in terms of the scope of the problem, in 2002, approximately 4% of those persons in treatment for addiction disorders in Fairfield County um, were there for opiate and heroin addiction problems. By 2008, we experienced a pretty significant uptick. We were at 31 percent. 31 percent of those persons in treatment for addiction disorders in our county were there because they had heroin or opiate addiction problems. Last month, as of last month, almost 70 percent of those persons in treatment for addiction disorders in Fairfield County, in rural suburban Fairfield County, were there because they were opiate or heroin addicted. Um, in terms of uh, criminal justice statistics, 85% um, of our drug court participants are either addicted to heroin or opiates. Uh, last year, in 2009, we completed a jail utilization study in conjunction with the Sheriff's Office. Um, we covered, they covered two years, 2003, which was at the beginning of the heroin and opiate epidemic in our community, and 2008, which was towards the end. In 2003, uh, we estimated that um, Fairfield County Commissioners spent about $350,000 incarcerating opiate addicts. By 2008, 52 percent of all jail days were accounted for by opiate addicts, that, um, and uh, the total cost was $2.5 million. We also found that more than 90 percent of those persons who were uh, incarcerated for opiate addiction problems uh, were repeat offenders who had been uh, in jail on an average of five um, previous times. Now, how could this have happened in Fairfield County, Ohio? Um, obviously, we have um, illicit pills coming up from Florida and Kentucky, uh, which is a serious problem. We also have heroin uh, coming down from uh, Columbus. Um, but uh, one staggering statistic that, um, that I've just recently um, uh, been able to come up with, um, I, I think uh, potentially explains most of our problem. The Ohio Pharmacy Board reports that for the four-county area of Fairfield, Athens, Hocking, and Perry counties, a region of 269,000 people, there were 13.9 million doses of oxycodone and hydrocodone dispensed legally across all of those residents. If every one of those 269,000 people received um, an average dose, that would be 52 Oxycontins, Percocets, and Vicodins for every man, woman, and child that lives in Fairfield, Athens, Hocking, and Vinton counties. If, um, if you include propoxyphene and um, tramadol in, uh, in, um, among those drugs, the numbers raise to 20.1 million, or 75 doses for every person that lives in our area. Unbelievable. Um, what works? For those people that have crossed the line and are now involved in our criminal justice system, uh, we have found that four things work. Um, a combination of drug court, intensive treatment, frequent random urine screens, and medication-assisted therapy using Suboxone. Uh, Suboxone is incredibly important from my perspective. It relieves craving without um, euphoria, and it displaces other opiates from the receptors. Now, what has been our experience? In the, uh, in the first two years of our drug court program uh, that included all four of those elements, we were able to suspend 14,000 jail days um, at a savings of $910,000 uh, to our county. Um, and again, a combination of all of those four things. Um, in closing, um, we are being overwhelmed in central and southern Ohio. 
um, the number of opiate and heroin addicts is staggering. We need more drug court capacity, we need more treatment, and we need more Suboxone. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Mr. O'Keefe. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll summarize my testimony here and request that my full testimony be inserted in the record. I had the privilege of working with the National Institute on Drug Abuse in the Cooperative Research and Development Agreement, which resulted in the ultimate FDA approval of buprenorphine or Suboxone for the treatment of opiate dependence. This successful industry government collaboration has resulted in the treatment of over two million people who might never have been treated for opiate dependence without the successful confluence of several factors. In the late 1990s, then Chairman Bliley, um, then Senator, Senator Biden, sorry, then Senator Biden, Senators Levin and Hatch, then Chairman Bliley and Hyde and Mr. Dingell, the Drug Addiction Treatment Act of 2000 was enacted. This act for the first time in nearly a century allowed effective agonist-based treatment for opiate dependence in patients in the privacy of the offices and clinics of qualified physicians. These congressional leaders recognized the significant inadequacies of the highly regulated closed addiction treatment programs which had grown out of temporary regulations, temporary fixes begun during the Nixon administration and regularly expanded often at the behest and to the delight of many of the closed system treatment providers since that time. These congressional leaders understood the stigma associated with addiction. They recognized that unlike cancer, AIDS, diabetes, hypertension, there were no patient advocacy groups to encourage better treatment. They recognized that despite the fact that nearly every one of us knows or is aware of a family member or friend devastated by this disease, Seldom will we talk about it, much less advocate for better research on its causes and treatments. These congressional leaders recognized that the pharmaceutical industry had little interest in spending scarce research budgets for products for a disease whose patients were often unemployed or underemployed, often had no insurance and no other medical coverage or ability to purchase these products. These leaders recognized that many rejected or failed to fully comprehend the increasingly validated findings of the scientific community related to this disease. They understood that many believed that addiction was simply irresponsible behavior which should be punished. They recognized that some of these same attitudes also permeated into the structures of medicine, academia, and government. Yet despite these barriers, the leadership provided by the Biden, Levin, Hatch, Bliley, Hyde, Dingle Consortium insisted on better treatment. Despite the reluctance, sometimes intransigence of the Food and Drug Administration, despite the expressed concerns of the DEA, despite the objections of entrenched commercial interests, despite the clear lack of enthusiasm of ONDCP, the 106th Congress passed the Drug Addiction Treatment Act unanimously in the Senate and 412 to one in the House. Thus began a paradigm shift in the treatment of opiate dependence in the United States and we all relaxed and that was a mistake. The barriers to development of products to treat addiction are still in place. Medications for addiction treatment are of little interest to the pharmaceutical industry because there is no incentive to commit scarce R&D funds to development of products unlikely to pr provide a significant return on that investment. The insufficiency of contract funds available to the National Institute on Drug Abuse limits their ability to engage in development activities suitable for FDA submissions. The failure of FDA to take a position on what constitutes efficacy in clinical trials for addiction is a major deterrent to investment and research on these products. The stigma of, ad of addiction and the fear of DEA leads many physicians to avoid treating this disease despite the fact that many of their patients suffer from it. Medical schools are providing inadequate training and treatment for this disease. Stigma prevents patients who suffer from it from seeking treatment. Additional and perhaps safer medications for the treatment of opiate dependence could probably be put in the hands of qualified providers within a year, except for the expressed lack of interest of the Food and Drug Administration 
and the less than helpful interpretations of the Control Substances Act by the DEA. For the benefit of millions of patients who need addiction treatment, I suggest that now is an appropriate time for the Congress to consider options which might encourage the commercial pharmaceutical industry to invest in research for safe and effective treatment of addictive disease. Among those options which seem to me worthy of consideration by the Congress are the following. Some modification of the Orphan Drug Act to provide exclusivity for products approved by FDA for this indication without regard to patient numbers. Perhaps a modification of Section 524 of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which was created last year by the FDA amendments two years ago of, of 2007 by authorizing the FDA to issue a priority review voucher for addictive diseases. Or an exclusive exclusivity voucher similar to one proposed by then Senator Biden allowing a sponsor of an approved addiction treatment product to transfer a period of exclusivity to another marketed product. And finally, perhaps a modification of Section 48D of the Internal Revenue Code, which would allow qualifying companies to claim a tax credit or receive a grant for qualifying therapeutic addiction treatment discovery projects. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Pops. You may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, distinguished members. Thanks for inviting me here today. I'm the CEO of a, of a biotech company called Alchemies with uh, about 600 employees, 300 of which are, are in the Boston area and about 300 of which are in Ohio. We, as a biotech company, are engaged in the, in the act of typically focusing on treatment of diseases that the large pharmaceutical companies shy away from. And in our case, this includes the treatment of, of addiction. So it's, it's really our re real world experience as one of the few companies working to develop medications in this area that, that brings me here today. With original seeding uh, funding from NIDA, our scientists created a drug called Vivitrol. Vivitrol is a once a month medication. It's a non-addictive medicine administered by injection once a month, which relieves the patient the need to take one or more pills one or more times a day. And as you may know, taking daily medication for uh, patients with addictive disorders is extremely difficult. Vivitrol was approved by the FDA in, for the treatment of alcohol dependence in 2006. And with that approval in hand, then, we set out on a research program to demonstrate Vivitrol's potential utility in the treatment of opioid dependence as well. That was very successful from a clinical standpoint. And we're hoping for FDA approval in this indication later this year. We began our work at the molecular level by trying to understand the neuroscience behind addiction. With our successes in the lab and in the clinic, we end up here in Washington with you with a deep interest in advancing the public policy so that our, our innovations actually get to patients. You're aware of, this, of the statistics, and I won't repeat many of them, but they're staggering. Millions of Americans with addiction are underserved or untreated and don't have options and access to the important treatment options. If you compare the use of medicine for the treatment of depression to that of alcohol dependence, it's instructive. The rate of medication prescribed per covered life for depression is almost one in 10 for antidepressants. And that compares for alcoholism to less than one in 5,000. The system in the US bearing the largest economic and public safety brunt of alcohol addiction is criminal justice, where 40% of all violent crimes involve alcohol. And despite this prevalence, over 80% of addicted offenders fail to receive treatment for their disease. So in addition to this being bad medicine, it's bad economics, these untreated patients are costing the system billions of dollars, as you know. That might have been understandable 30 years ago when the scientific understanding of the addicted brain was at its infancy. But today, knowing what we know about the neuroscience of addiction, the failure to use medicines is inexcusable. With the FDA now having approved medications based on rigorous demonstration of their safety and their efficacy, and with the NIH and the Institute of Medicine calling for their use in combination with counseling, it's now time for society to begin to treat substance abuse as the diseases that it is. This work at Alchemies has become very real to us. We receive letters and stories from patients who've benefited from the use of Vivitrol as part of their treatment program, and they're incredibly moving and they're a driving motivation within our organization. But we are definitely in the minority. 
The treatment of addiction is not a mainstream pharmaceutical market, as you've, as you've heard. None of the largest pharmaceutical companies sell products for the treatment of addiction. But I believe this can and will change. Government can help. And in fact, I believe the government policy changes m are likely necessary to solidify the development of new medications for alcohol and drug addiction. We have specific re recommendations that we summarize in the written testimony, but in, in, in just brief nutshell, there are some simple and powerful things that, that can be done. First, simply implementing established treatment standards like those of the National Quality Forum and make them a condition to participating in public and private programs would be a, a huge step forward. These standards exist. Number two, providing grants and incentives for states to assist them with establishing addiction pharmacology programs. Third, simply using performance-based metrics, like you hear about in Baltimore and in, in Ohio, to fund programs that work and accredit providers that use those programs that work. And then finally, in an, an even more aggressive idea, similar to what you did with vaccines, is to jumpstart the market with guaranteed minimum purchase orders for a limited period of time. These kinds of initiatives represent ways that government leadership can help patients gain access to effective medications, create incentives for companies to invest in R&D, and avoid the huge costs of non-treatment of these patients. So I'll finish there. We, we really do believe that state and federal governments can play a role here and begin to bring the promise of the modern pharmaceutical research that we do in our company and other companies, bring that to the, to the treatment of, of, of addiction. Thank you again. Thank you. We're going to uh, we'll move on now to questions of the second panel. I'd like to begin with Dr. Uh, Samet. Some in the substance abuse treatment field reject the use of addiction medications as substituting one drug for another. What is your medical opinion about this? Uh, medications for addiction can be of the type that uh, are agonists to the receptors, where the term of substituting the drug, or not, often antagonists. The evidence is that both types of medications are effective. That's the data. To say otherwise, I would say, is the entering of stigma into the evidence for treatment. And uh, so how do we destigmatize uh, addiction and bring into mainstream medicine? How can we do this uh, in a way that gets the benefit of medications in the way other chronic diseases are able to do that? Um, I think we can do it by pushing the concept of evidence-based medicine. I think that's happening. I think when I began on faculty of a medical school 20 years ago, it seemed like a distant goal. I think it's happening right now. So what you're saying needs to happen is happening. It just has to be accelerated. It's very possible we've seen it. Now, Mr. Mo Mr. Warren, you testified that the total annual cost to operate the Baltimore uh, buprenorphine initiative for 2009 included funding for medications, outpatient counseling, physician, nursing, treatment advocate staff. That total was, I think, $2.8 million. Now, it seems like a lot of money, but you've testified that with the use of uh, uh, buprenorphine, you have reduced the period of stabilizing patients and transferring them to outpatient programs from 281 days to 155 days, enabling you to treat more patients. So. Is this program cost effective? We have found it to be hugely, hugely cost effective. Um, uh, for us to maintain that particular person on their medication and in treatment forever and ever and ever um, would be mind-numbing financially. What we're able to do, though, is, is realize what is out there now in the healthcare system, utilize the block grant to fund people who are truly uninsured, help them get insurance, and then once they get medical assistance, they then move to that pool of funding, which the state of Maryland then brings in 61 cents for every dollar. So for us, we're able to treat um, 
three to four times as many people uh, than historically we would simply because we're trying to optimize the public health system uh, to the fullest. Now, Mr. Hall, has uh, Fairfield County, Ohio, found it cost effective to pay for these medications as part of a drug court program? And have you you've been able to reduce the incarceration cost that skyrocketed in your county as a result of opiate addiction, uh, as a result of the opiate addiction epidemic? Uh, Chairman Kucinich, we've, we've been hit by a tidal wave of opiate addiction in um, central and southern Ohio. Um, the Did initial- you, Let me just stop you there, why? I mean, aside from the obvious, why? I, I, can, um, I can speculate. Um, I, I think it really, um, it goes back to three things. Uh, you, you, um, we have a tremendous number of um, opiates coming up from Florida and Kentucky and Portsmouth, Ohio. Um, we have heroin from Mexico coming in from Columbus. But from my perspective, the big problem um, is um, an, uns an unsuspecting healthcare community that is just inundating um, our part of the state with um, unnecessary and inappropriate levels of prescription painkillers. Again, 13.9 million doses of um, oxycodone and hydrocodone uh, products alone across a population of 269,000 people. That's 52 doses for every man, woman, and child that lives in those four counties. It's, it's staggering. Um, I think we're at the tip of the sword. I think so, this so problem- who's And who's consuming these? I'm sorry, say again, please. Who's consuming this? Uh, um, I think that we probably have a, um, I, I think we could have I mean, It's not every man, woman, several, or child, so who's, con who's consuming them? Uh, um, I think we probably have several thousand people in um, our area, in, in Fairfield County maybe, that are opiate addicted, um, that are still not known to our system. So somebody who's, somebody who's opiate addicted, how many of those might one addict take in a day? Well, you know, that's a great question, and um, uh, probably some clinical experts could answer that better than me, but what we do know is, or what I do know from discussions with um, a good friend of mine, Dr. Uh, Philip Pryor, an addictionologist, that, um, that as human beings, we have an almost unlimited ability or capacity to tolerate opiates. Um, if, if you look at um, the tolerance levels for alcohol, uh, the, the ratio is about four to one. A, a short, uh, a, um, an early stage alcoholic, uh, can drink about a six pack a day and get what they need. Um, late stage alcoholic may drink a case. But if you look at opiate addiction, an early stage opiate addict may use 60 milligrams a day, but a late stage opiate heroin addict may be using the equivalent of one to 2,000 milligrams of heroin. Uh, that's a 70 to one ratio. Uh, Mr. Mavamatis, can, uh, can your personal experience shed some light on this in terms of uh, the volume of, of a particular drug. You, you, if, you if, if you look at the shorter acting opiates that are pharmaceutical like Vicodin, Percodan, Percocet, things like that, the, the range is pretty broad, but it can be anywhere from 20, 25 tablets per day to, to what I was consuming, you know, up to 100 or more. 25 tablets at what dose? Uh, five, five, five milligram to ten milligram. When when you were uh, moving into this addiction, were you aware that you were doing that? No, no. You know, it 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 was a slow and unsuspecting process. I went to the doctor. I did everything the doctor asked me to do. I was always honest with the doctor. Um, and, and my, my decline in life, I guess my personal life, my emotional life was, was slow too. Um, I would slowly become, I was slowly becoming detached from, from my business, from my family, from, from my community, from things that I always did, things that I loved to do. Um, and and um, you, what I didn't realize at the time is, is my body's building a tolerance. So when the doctor asked me, you know, Mike, how do you feel? Well, doc, you know, I feel pretty good, but the sciatic nerve started to act up again. And there, there went the process um, until I realized I had a problem. And during, that, during that period, uh, you said you put on weight, so you, you ate more. It, it increased your appetite, is that right? 
or did you just put I, I don't think it was so much my well Mike likes to eat and being in the restaurant and being Greek obviously but I don't think it was that I think it was more being detached you know really slowing down you know you and spend, instead of spending 14 hours a day in the business six days a week it, it, you know what I mean it's a slow low, slow decline instead of coaching three junior high school sports all of a sudden you're coaching one and and I, it, so it's a withdrawal from exactly work and a, re a withdrawal a, a withdrawal from normalcy I guess is a good way to describe it and and by by the um, the winter of 03 04 when I decided you know you have a problem and you need to start figuring out what it is so I started the process of elimination what has changed you know my weight increased up to you know somewhere between 255 265 something like that and and that's when I decided you know it, it, it has to be the medications you're taking so stop taking them and that that's when reality hit me in the face uh, back to mr. Hall T tell me more about uh, the the extraordinary level of consumption of these opiates that is going on talk to me more about that what do you, what do you uh, I, um, I, to, to be uh, completely um, honest uh, mr. chairman um, the um, the data is still um, that we have is still unfolding um, we're um, I don't know that we can estimate with any clear um, sense how many people there are in our county that are affected um, given the uh, the tolerance ratios um, we fear that it could we feel we fear that there could be several thousand people in Fairfield County alone we know um, that there are many counties to the south of us that have even worse problems than are, we do. are you are you are you laying the groundwork for uh, epidemiological studies or for longitudinal studies that would try to see any other markers or indices that would reflect upon this uh, we, staggering amount of uh, drug use. Yes, sir. We we desperately need um, that type of work. We've um, conduct, conducted some um, opinion surveys in our county um, that are also quite disturbing. Um, a survey of 350 Fairfield County adults indicated that around 78 percent of um, the people that responded. Uh, were aware of someone in their immediate family um, or among their friends that had received an opiate prescription within the past year. 22% um, uh, were aware of someone that was using an opiate prescription um, without, or I, I'm sorry, an opiate painkiller without a prescription. Um, so it appears to me that the problem is fairly widespread in our area. And um, those counties immediately to the south of us appear to have a bigger problem than we do. And, and these are prescriptions as opposed to black market? The, I, I think it's a mix. I, it's hard to discern the degree to which they are uh, prescription uh, um, prescribed as opposed to coming in illicitly. Uh, what we do know, there is a, an anesthesiologist in our community that is beginning to do some research about diversion. And he believes that, um, uh, that among those patients in his practice um, that are receiving um, opiate prescriptions, that maybe as much as 20% of those prescriptions are being uh, diverted for, Ill uh, for illicit use. Let me ask uh, uh, Mr. Mavramatis again. Uh, as you were sliding into this addiction, what, what, kind, what kind of feeling did you get? I mean, what, are the, what, is this, what did these opiates do for you? That, that, that's, that's what it was, was deceiving. You know, I, I, was taking, I was prescribed Vicodin for pain, and I took it. And other than helping me with the pain, I didn't have any other sensation. I didn't have a high sensation. Um, you know, when I, when I was young, fresh out of high school, and, and you'd go out and have a few drinks and have a good time or, or whatever you might uh, partake in, I knew what feeling high was. So for uh, you, this wasn't about getting high. It was about what, pain relief? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I had injured myself remodeling our restaurant, and I had done damage to the L5 disc in my back, and and th that's been a slow progression, you know. So if uh, you so if you took the drug, you didn't have pain, but you kept taking it, and you got addicted. Right, and 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 as I would would um, time would go on, evidently the 
tolerance to the medication would build so the pain would start to creep back in. The doctor says, Mike, how you feeling? I'd tell him honestly, you know, either I was great or doc, you know, the pain started, the sciatic nerve starting to act up again, you know, or, or you know, I'm having trouble with getting up with, with muscle spasms or, or aches in the middle of the night or whatever, so up the dose. You know, th this um, uh, discussion in the previous panel, we got into this too with Mr. Kennedy's help, um, you know, getting into the, the area of effective pain management, non-narcotic approaches, if they can, you know, if they can be effective, that non-narcotic, non-addictive approaches. It's um, uh, pain management's a whole area of medicine that I suppose uh, needs to be mindful of the kind of discussion we're having today. Now, someone had his hand up that wanted to get Mr. Warren, you wanted to enter into this discussion? Uh, this issue of uh, what's driving the drug trade, uh, prescription uh, drugs uh, uh, was sort of the interchange that I wanted to respond to. We have a very large um, uh, market uh, it's well known, Lexington Market in Baltimore City. And uh, it's an area of our city that uh, numerous high profile individuals want to redevelop. And so the theory was that, well, their methadone clients or buprenorphine clients that are going there and selling their drugs, and that's why you have an open air drug market around that market. Well, what we did was uh, for six months we monitored who was arrested uh, at that market, and at the same time looked at uh, who showed up at the detention center. And so what we found was that uh, a minuscule, like two, three percent of people being arrested were in drug treatment, and uh, they were not there selling their methadone or selling their buprenorphine. What they were there was people were there selling prescription full agonist drugs. The Percocet, Percodan, Vicodin, and you know where they got those prescriptions is up to conjecture. My hunch is, you know, they were taking from their grandmother, their parents, their relatives' uh, medicine cabinets, and going down and selling some of that prescription drugs that people take for legitimate pain medication. And and there needs to be a significant physician awareness campaign that uh, they need to improve their monitoring of the prescriptions that they're giving to individuals uh, because that was what was driving the drug trade in this particular area of Baltimore City. Um, Mr. O'Keefe and Mr. Pops, how critical was the NIH funding and support to both your company's development of uh, Suboxone and Vivitrol? Is there a strong case for continued federal funding and research on medications development to um, create progress in this area? Mr. O'Keefe. It was absolutely cr crucial for Suboxone. It would not have happened without Suboxone, without, without um, research from NIDA. <clears throat> and a series of things had to happen. It had to be, there had to be some exclusivity. Um, there had to be uh, approval by the FDA, and there had to be funding from NIDA. Now, be before we go to Mr. Pops, I just want to ask you as a follow-up. You stated that the failure of the FDA to take a position on what constitutes efficacy in clinical trials for addiction is a major deterrent to investment and research on these products. It is a major on. deterrent. Uh, FDA has not decided yet how they want to measure the efficacy of drugs. For example, if a pharmaceutical company had a new product for the treatment of opiate dependence, um, well, opiate dependence may be a different story. Let, let's look at something like for which there is no treatment like methamphetamine. The FDA cannot yet decide whether a reduction in use of methamphetamine is a measure of efficacy or whether total abstention from meth from methamphetamine is the is the mark that they would put on the chart for efficacy and until that happens 
no pharmaceutical company is going to spend a great deal of money if they don't know what the end is for them to research. So that's one of the major problems of, of um, um, deterrence to development to, to interest the pharmaceutical companies. Mr. Props. So in, similarly, the, uh, the NIDA funding w was important. NIDA had been calling for literally 30 years for the development of a long-acting injectable form of an opioid receptor antagonist. And it, it really took until our technology became uh, available for us to make that happen. So the, the seed funding w was important, but it's important to recognize the, the bigger question that we probably had to come up with another couple hundred million dollars on top of that to develop the drug. And I would say that today, NIDA's voice amplifying and underscoring the importance of the data that resulted from clinical trials is extremely important at this moment. So it wasn't just at the beginning, it's throughout the entire process based on the quality of the data that comes from the research. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Samet, our subcommittee has found, and uh, Mr. O'Keefe testified, that one of the reasons doctors are hesitant to treat, to treat patients who are addicted to drugs with medications is because of the scrutiny it brings from the Drug Enforcement Agency, which regulates opiate-based uh, medications. Have you found this to be true in, in your work and your involvement with the American Society of Addiction Medicine? Um, actually, I'm probably one of the few docs that had the DEA come by and say, we want to check what you're doing. Um, I, I think it's likely more perception than reality. Uh, docs are concerned because DEA can make your life um, difficult. But docs who are using Suboxone in fairly established, agreed upon approaches with patients, uh, in truth, um, don't have a lot to worry about would be the way I'd put it. You know, I can speak from my one situation where what they asked for, we gave them, they said, good work. Uh, but there is that perception. Is there any, uh, I just want to go down the line here, starting with uh, Mr. Uh, Mevamatis. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to say uh, to the subcommittee for the record, uh, with respect to the direction that you think we should be taking and looking at for the purposes of uh, having a more effective national drug policy, Mr. Mavramatis, and then we'll go right down the line. You can just take a minute. Go okay, ahead. Thank you. Um, I, I can use Suboxone as the example because that's what I know. You With, with Suboxone, unlike the older recovery medications, you actually have a medication that is proactive and productive and, and fosters and lends itself to recovery, yet it has restrictions on it that are counterproductive. So when, when I go to help people or my, my peers, so to speak, find doctors and, and, and find help, it, it's, it, it's, it's not there. You know, a, doc, a doctor prescribing Suboxone can only prescribe to 100 patients. And, and then when I look at it and, and what people are paying, in, in our area in Columbus, we're, we're blessed to have a lot of doctors prescribing. In other parts of Ohio, for instance, where there aren't any, the, the expense is night and day. Competition brings the price down. Um, I, I think there's like overall maybe 1% doctors willing to prescribe. Um, so I, I think my feeling from my point of view is if wh whatever you do, use the gains we now have and we're going to have more with medical science to be more productive and more proactive and take that education and, and group it, uh, blend it with the, med with the education of old, the peer support, the spiritual and all that. So, so we're moving forward instead of doing little things that with, e with each step we take forward, we're backing up a step or half steps. So. Thank you. Dr. Samet. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity to reflect on that. I, th I think that with more medications available to treat addictions, more patients will be treated. A few medications can treat 
a sizable number. The more you have, the more options to include those patients who don't succeed first time around. But that's going to also require training physicians and nurses to know how to treat patients for these problems, to understand these problems. It hasn't been traditionally part of the curriculum, but it's becoming, and that needs to be encouraged. Finally, because, as you heard from Dr. McClellan, the substance use treatment system began independent of the medical system, more coordinating care between that system and the medical system is critical, both communication at every level, and really the time has come to make the treatment of addictions a mainstream medical issue, in part so that we help people with those problems, and in part so that we can treat everything else that's going on, because if we don't, that's not possible. Thank you, Mr. Warren. Uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to share on this important point. I, I would say three things. First, uh, buprenorphine has enabled us to establish relationships with other parts of the healthcare system that heretofore we've had no contact with. FQHCs, hospitals, primary care physicians. It creates, I believe, the foundation of, of learning that we'll need when national health care reform hits in 2014 and beyond. The second thing that I think really needs to be stressed about Suboxone is Suboxone doesn't cure anybody. Uh, it simply provides the opportunity to help. Um, it provides us the leverage to make amends for uh, bankrupt educational systems, social support networks, and so forth that need to be created for these individuals that have never had this support before, and it gives us the time to develop it. Uh, that's the important thing. This, the th second piece is if we want to make a difference in crime in this country, uh, we have to realize that drug addiction drives crime. If we can offer an intervention uh, that allows, in the conversation I had with our police commissioner the other day, he said the two biggest things you could give a police officer would be here's a card you can give somebody to get a job, and here's a card to give somebody so they can get help for their drug treatment. The people who cause us the most angst in the communities in which we live are the people suffering from addiction. And creative uses of drug court, detention centers, and the prison system to help people I think will make a big difference. There was a, I started a therapeutic community in one institution. I went to graduation. This gentleman came up to me and says, you know, hey, last six months have been great. I've learned so much. But listen, I know I'm about to be released in about a week. I need medication-assisted treatment or else I'm going to go right back. They need that support. Uh, to, to reinvigorate their lives. So uh, medication-assisted treatment is a good opportunity for a whole variety of reasons. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Um, yes, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, I believe that uh, what is going on in um, central and southern Ohio is a signal for a national emergency. Um, I think that opiates are probably the most addictive substance known to man, and um, that without a multi-layered approach, we're going to have hundreds of thousands of people um, in prison unnecessarily and uh, dying um, way too early. Um, again, I think we need to take a multi-layered approach to this problem that includes things like drug court, intensive outpatient therapy, and um, medication-assisted th um, therapy. I'm personally familiar with Suboxone. I think it's made a profound difference in our community. We need more of all of those things to combat this problem. Mr. O'Keefe. Mr. Chairman, we've heard a great deal about the success of and the, and the advantages of Suboxone and treatment for patients. I mentioned in my testimony the concerns about, about the Drug Enforcement Administration and the fear of the Drug Enforcement Administration. As an example, back in July of last year, the Drug Enforcement Administration sent a letter to all physicians who, had, who were qualified to use buprenorphine for the treatment of opiate dependence. And they simply said, to accurately plan for and properly allocate resources effectively and efficiently, we are attempting to discern whether or not the data wave physician portion of your medical practice will need to be inspected. Uh, the letter was viewed to be fairly threatening by many physicians, and physicians rejected, uh, objected to it. It, in fact, also included uh, a request for information and a form which was never approved by um, OMB. And after objections by physicians, the 
DEA and, and the ONDCP, the DEA agreed that they would send out a letter clarifying. That clarifying letter said, speaking of the earlier letter, that letter was not intended to discourage or limit treatment services or imply that inspections were somehow the result of targeting for individual activity. If a practitioner chooses to return their DEA waived registration to DEA due to inactivity, DEA would simply remove that practitioner from our regulatory inspection program. Such, such action would prevent unnecessary on-site visits and enable DEA to employ its resources more efficiently. Most physicians took that as an invitation to turn in their right to prescribe Suboxone. As a result of that, of the 18,000 physicians in the United States who were at that time able to prescribe uh, 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 buprenorphine, 676 of them voluntarily returned their registrations to the Drug Enforcement Administration, resulting in 676 hundred, six, 6,760, sorry, 67,000 patients who were denied treatment because each of those could prescribe for 100 patients. These are exactly the kind of physicians that we're trying to recruit into the program. We want the physician who is treating only one or two patients to be able to treat that patient. But so long as they're threatened by the DEA, they have no intention of opening themselves to an inspection by a gun-toting DEA agent uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the treatment of one or two patients. So I think it's a real deterrent. The DEA is a deterrent, significant deterrent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pops. Proceed. So first of all, hearings like this one today are very important, so thank you very much for your leadership on this. I was moved personally by Congressman Kennedy's remarks in, in this idea that we tolerate suboptimal outcomes in the treatment of this disease while patients go to treatment facilities, quote unquote, and receive suboptimal care. It's a travesty. So as I said in my earlier comments, simply collecting data on the, on the outcomes that one gets with Suboxone or with Vivitrol and, and publishing that data, disseminating it, and holding people to these standards would be a, a really important role that government can play. And then I, I also would amplify the, the comment about returning servicemen and women and, and veterans. Biotechnology drugs in general are often not on the VA formulary. And so the benefit of all this modern research, which we really are the leaders in the world here in the, in the U.S., is often not translated into uh, the people who protect us, and I think it's, it's a mistake. I want to thank uh, each and every one of the panelists. Uh, this has been a, uh, uh, a hearing that will lead us into the next uh, series of hearings that we're going to have on national drug policy. Uh, this subcommittee is charged with uh, responsibility for oversight over national drug policy and for making recommendations. So I, I want to thank you for the role that you're playing in helping to better inform uh, the members of this committee, subcommittee, and the members of Congress as to the directions that we might take that would be more effective uh, for the um, individual who's struggling with an addiction and for the society at large. Uh, I'm Dennis Kucinich, Chairman of the Domestic Policy Subcommittee of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Uh, the title and topic of today's hearing has been treating addiction as a disease, the promise of medication-assisted recovery. Uh, this uh, subcommittee will continue to uh, work in this area and look at uh, a variety of, of, of treatments and to support those uh, that are uh, working to try to meet the challenge of the scourge of addiction. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, being no further business before this subcommittee, Stand adjourned.